Well, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to yet another entry into Kalkai Media's popular Invest Nest webinar series. This is the Commodity Super Run, a rapid fire session with four ASX players. My name is James Preston. I'm an anchor and reporter with Kalkai TV, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Now, just before we start the session officially, it is important that you are aware that this webinar is for informational purposes only. It's not a solicitation or recommendation to buy, sell or hold any other stocks or companies that are discussed today, or of course, engage in any particular investment practices. So we're neither licensed nor qualified to provide that advice to you. This is purely for informational purposes. Now, with that said, COVID-19 outbreaks and the energy crisis in the Northern Hemisphere have continued to bog down the global economic recovery. And to make matters worse, of course, the war between Russia and Ukraine has sent oil and food prices soaring. And in turn, that's put even more strain on economies across the globe. A flow on effect of higher gas prices as well could be accelerating the demand for electric vehicles, which is, of course, a move that is already gaining traction with an increase in climate conscious consumers. And that, of course, has been recently evidenced by the results of our federal election, which saw a lot of teal independence getting in and also some extra seats for the Greens. And the demand outlook for several critical minerals in the renewable space, including lithium, copper, nickel and cobalt, or as they are called, the battery pack minerals, is expected to continue to remain robust. So to discuss this exact sector, I'll be sitting down with some of Kalkai Media's very valued clients, namely the CEO and MD of Platina Resources, Corey Nolan, CEO of Alchemy Resources, James Wilson, Exploration Manager of C29 Metals Limited, Dave Nelson, and the Executive Director of Jindalee Resources, Mr. Lindsay Dudfield. Plenty to get through, so let's get stuck in with our first guest, Corey Nolan, the CEO and MD of Platina Resources. Corey is a seasoned mining executive, and of course, he does also have significant experience in the world of mining, 25 years for that matter. And Platina Resources holds a portfolio of highly prospective projects at various stages of development. So to take us through Platina and all that they're doing, I now throw it over to Corey. Corey, the stage is yours, and thank you so much for joining us today. Great, thank you very much. And um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to come and uh, discuss uh, Platina's latest uh, exploration activities. Uh, last time I spoke to the Calcai network, we were in the process of uh, diver di divesting some of our palladium assets, which we've now successfully uh, completed. And uh, we're in the process of acquiring some new gold projects in Western Australia. Uh, we've now got those uh, bedded down. And in the second half of this year, we'll be looking to uh, to complete uh, at least two back-to-back -back drill programs across two of our projects. So I'll take you through that today. So Platina is a 70 million market cap. We own, uh, wholly own 100% three uh, gold projects in Western Australia. And we also own 100% of the world-class uh, Platina Scanian project in New South Wales, uh, where we'll be looking to, uh, to, to unlock some value. Uh, we currently have uh, about $1.5 million in cash and uh, $7.6 million in, uh, sorry, and $6.1 million in, uh, in four listed share investments. Uh, the most uh, significant of those two are our <coughs> stake in uh, Alien Metals, where we have 138 million shares. Um, Alien's developing some uh, iron ore and uh, palladium projects in Western Australia. And uh, we recently divested our interest in Money Money to, uh, to Alien. And we also have a significant stake in Major Precious Metals, which is a Canadian listed company and uh, they acquired our uh, Greenland Palladium project from us uh, about 12 months ago. And uh, they've recently completed a, an eight and a half thousand meter drill program there. It cost them over $20 million. And um, they uh, hopefully have uh, all of those results, assay results into the market uh, in the next few weeks. And then they'll be pushing ahead with a, uh, a big upgrade of you know, what is one of the world's largest uh, palladium deposits outside of uh, Russia uh, or South Africa. So we're hoping to, to see some, uh, some real upside in, uh, in our share investments in the next uh, few months. So our, our story is quite simple. We're a gold focused exploration company. Um, our, ex, our share price upside will come from uh, uh, exploration outcomes. 
uh, but we're in a unique position where we uh, we have this significant portfolio of investments. We'll be looking to divest those investments over time and uh, and use that, that those cash proceeds to fund our exploration activities and uh, and minimise the uh, dilution of our shareholders. And uh, we'll also be looking to uh, to unlock the value of our Scanian project, and we have a number of initiatives underway to achieve that objective. So we've got a strategic focus towards uh, West Australian gold. Uh, we've got two projects in the world-class uh, Yilgarn province. I think everyone's pretty aware of uh, of the potential of uh, of that area. Probably a little less known to people is the Ashburton process, uh, uh, the Ashburton Basin. Um, it's nestled between the Yilgarn and the uh, and the Pilbara Craton, which has obviously uh, become a very hot spot destination uh, following the uh, you know the significant success that the Greys had with the Hemi project. Uh, there are a number of uh, world class multi million ounce projects in the Ashburton, and uh, we believe it's a, a relatively underexplored basin. Uh, we've recently appointed uh, Rowan Deshpand. Um, Rowan is going to be our uh, our, our new manager driving our exploration strategy in Western Australia. And Rowan actually just uh, joined us from De Grey, where he was involved uh, in the De Grey project over the last, in, well, in the Hemi uh, project over the last four years as part of the discovery team and uh, turning that into a, a, a very, you know, world class multi million ounce uh, deposit. Rowan will also. Uh, be assisting us with uh, with M and A and looking at new project opportunities. Just going through our two gold projects, uh, two key projects in um, in Western Australia. So we've got Xanadu. Uh, Xanadu is located about uh, 38 kilometres south of Paribadu. So we've got uh, very good uh, logistics. We can uh, fly um, easily into to Paribadu, and then there's a, a high quality road into our project site. Uh, we've got a very large uh, tenement package here. It's uh, well over 500 square kilometres, uh, but most of the historical exploration has been focused on the uh, on the northwestern corner. It's about 10 kilometres of uh, of strike on a uh, on a splay of the uh, Yanga Gil Gilkey uh, uh, fault zone, and uh, we're also um, in very close proximity to the uh, to the Mount Olympus resource, which is. Uh, essentially a 2 million ounce endowment. They've mined about 350,000 um, ounces out of that. And there's currently 1.65 million ounces in, in that deposit. And um, Kalamazoo uh, have been completing, uh, currently completing a, a number of dual programs to try and expand that resource. So the initial, the uh, Xanadu projects uh, had quite a lot of uh, historical exploration. Uh, a lot of the exploration activities were really focused on shallow drilling, targeting the oxide resources in this system, and uh, with the focus of, of building a heat leach project. Uh, you can see uh, a little open cut mine there and uh, some of the, the legacy uh, heat leach operations that were left behind. There were a number of uh, very significant um, intersections, both in terms of grade and widths in this project. Um, and we believe that it's got a, a huge amount of potential. It just needs a, a systematic exploration program and, uh, and a lot more deep drilling. So the attractiveness of this project for us is that we're on a major uh, fault zone. There's a two million ounce uh, ore body uh, nearby. Our main target area up in that Northwest is a 10 kilometer um, uh, strike a zone of uh, very intense mineralization. There's a lot of gold throughout this system, certainly at the shallow levels. And we believe that we have the favorable host rocks here uh, to, to host a, a multi-million ounce uh, gold deposit. So we are, our strategy here is twofold. One is we, uh, we wanna drill and uh, see what the potential is to expand on some of the uh, historical uh, oxide resources that had been defined and then to also target deeper into this system and try and get a try and find the location of where all this gold in this uh, 10 kilometer strike system uh, come from uh, we complete recently completed a, a major program of geophysics which identified a, a number of uh, ip anomalies which we believe uh, are the potentially the sources of uh, of the mineralization in the system so uh, we're just in the process of bedding down to get our cultural heritage surveys completed 
and uh, hopefully we'll be drilling here in the, in the next six to eight uh, weeks. Our second project in Western Australia is Chala. So Chala's uh, two tenements, uh, th nearly 300 square kilometre package, um, nestled right between uh, Mount Magnet, UME and Sandstone. So, you know, multi-million ounce um, uh, deposits. And what's really intriguing about this is that we're right bang in the middle of all that and there's not a single drill hole in our tenement package. So um, we believe that, uh, that there's a, a lot of potential here. Now, the reason that uh, there hasn't been much drilling here is that the, uh, these tenements uh, have got a lot of transported cover across them. So what we've had to do is find a technique uh, for sort of looking through that cover and looking to identify gold anomalies. So we've done a fairly systematic campaign over the last uh, two years uh, nearly 4,000 sample, soil samples, and uh, we've identified about 11 an anomalies. And our plan is, uh, as soon as we've completed a Xanadu drill program, to come back here and do an air core drilling program and, uh, and test some of those uh, soil anomalies uh, with a view that, that if, we, if we get success from that program, uh, we can come back and do some deeper RC drilling. So we've got two quite different tenements uh, here. Um, our Chala West uh, tenement I really like. Um, there's a green, we're on the fringe of a, a greenstone belt here. We've got that major Chala shear zone running through there, which are the perfect ingredients for, uh, for, for ho hosting uh, major gold deposits. The more northern tenement our pain, it sits in the Painesville gold trend. Um, you can see some, uh, some photos um, of some gold in quartz and uh, we're aware of a, a lot of prospectors picking up uh, nuggets around the, uh, the Elsie gold mine. Uh, we've actually got some uh, attractive rock chips ourselves uh, on some areas of our crop there going up to nearly uh, seven grams. So we think this is a, a really prospective tenement as well. And again, it's just never been drilled. So really looking forward to, to getting on this tenement uh, and getting some drilling done. Um, our Mount Narrow tenement, um, it's located along the Darling Fault zone on the, uh, the fringe of the, uh, the western Yilga and Creighton. Uh, we're about 300 kilometres north of the, the Jilma uh, project. Uh, this is a sort of a, a very exciting new province. Uh, we believe that uh, you know, we've got the right combination of, uh, of rocks and structure here um, to, to, to host uh, uh, nickel, PG and, and, uh, and gold projects. So um, once that tenement is granted, uh, we'll be getting in uh, and doing soil sampling and, uh, and geophysics and pretty much uh, you know, following the, the model that's been very successful in this area uh, by the likes of, uh, of Chalice. Uh, and finally, from a project perspective, uh, we own 100% of the Patina Scanian project in New South Wales. Uh, it's probably the, what well, we believe it's the world's highest grade and uh, uh, largest Scanian deposit. It's hosted in a, in a laterite, uh, de laterite uh, deposit with uh, more than 48,000 metres of drilling. Uh, we've got a proven ore reserve and uh, a completed DFS back in 2018. Uh, we've been working on a number of strategies to, to unlock value from this project including um, doing some downstream master alloy test work, uh, looking at uh, expanding the, the potential product mix and, uh, and markability of uh, the products that would come from this project. And uh, we're currently working on uh, securing a, uh, the, you know, the required um, permits that we need to secure a mining license. So um, we've got both of those programs uh, happening in parallel. And, uh, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of interest in Scanium in, um, in uh, recent months uh, with both uh, Rio Tinto um, and uh, other significant uh, aluminium players moving into the Scanium business and, uh, and starting production. So we think that um, there's real potential to create value from this project. In fact, if you were to, to take a look at uh, some of the Scanium uh, peers uh, globally, uh, there's two pure play companies, uh, Imperial and uh, Scanium International. Um, they effectively have uh, market caps either close or uh, significantly larger than, uh, than Patina, based purely on their Scanium projects, even though they're inferior projects to the, to the Platina Scanium project. And then if you were to, to look at the... Uh, the benchmark companies that do nickel, cobalt and scanium, 
uh, you'll all see that uh, they have significantly higher market caps than Platina as well. And Platina, ha Platina has its portfolio of investments, uh, plus all its uh, gold opportunities as well. So we believe that uh, we're a very undervalued company. So just wrapping up, uh, we believe we've got a, a really exciting six months in front of us. Uh, we'll be looking to do back-to-back uh, -back dual programs starting at uh, Xanadu, going on to Chala. Uh, once Mount Nairi gets granted, we'll be uh, starting exploration st uh, straight away. Uh, we're working on a really active program of, uh, of looking at how we unlock value from our, from our Scanium project. And uh, in parallel with that, uh, we're looking at a number of ways of growing our portfolio in, in Western Australia and funding that by uh, selling our investments and, uh, and using the cash proceeds to, to undertake our uh, exploration and, uh, and keep our capital structure very tight. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Well, Corey, thank you so much for that presentation. Of course, we'll get to hear a bit more from yourself when we do the rapid fire round at the conclusion of all four of our presentations, but really insightful stuff there. And uh, it's great to see what Platina is doing. Let's now move on though, to our next speaker, namely the CEO of Alchemy Resources, James Wilson. Now, James is a geologist with over 15 years of extensive experience in exploration and operational roles both in Australia and also abroad. He's dabbled in a wide range of resources, including gold, copper, nickel, and uranium, and he ultimately has an enormous knowledge base of the sector. As for the company itself, Alchemy Resources is committed to building a portfolio of high quality mineral resources with advanced gold, battery metals, and base metal projects in WA and also New South Wales. And to take us through it in a lot more detail than I certainly can do, I now turn it over to the other James in this webinar, that is James Wilson. Please share your screen, mate, and thanks for being here today. Thanks, James, and uh, much appreciated to Calkine, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, participating today. Um, as James mentioned, uh, we're a, a, a variable commodity uh, company at Alchemy and uh, I've had some recent uh, quite exciting developments which I'll share with you today. Um, so Alchemy is a, uh, a multi-commodity company. We've got projects in Western Australia and in New South Wales. Uh, in particular, our focus uh, is, is across all of them, but uh, most recently at, at Coroni, uh, it's our 100% owned um, gold targets uh, in Western Australia. Uh, we've also just recently discovered some uh, lithium on those tenements as well and uh, those tenements have never been explored for lithium. Uh, we've also got a, uh, applications in the north of there at Lake Rebecca which sit right next door to some uh, major gold deposits. Uh, in the Briar we have uh, two JVs, one with Sandfire uh, on uh, which is a free carried exploration interest and also a development joint venture with uh, Superior Gold uh, on uh, the Hermes and Hermes South deposits, which we own 20% off and uh, could provide Alchemy with cash flow down the track. In New South Wales, uh, the Luckland projects, obviously the, uh, the Gilmore Suture uh, has been a very uh, a big area of, uh, of focus recently with base metals interest. And we've got uh, several projects there, including Yellow Mountains, high grade copper gold. Uh, West Lynn, it's a uh, battery metals project with nickel, cobalt and alumina and uh, our high grade overflow uh, gold and uh, base metals deposit. Uh, just the company itself, we've, uh, we've got a market cap of around about 30 million today. We've had a bit of an uptick, which has been good. Uh, around about two and a half million cash as of the March quarter. And uh, we're gonna round it out board with uh, Lindsay Dunfield, funnily enough, who's gonna be presenting uh, uh, later on today. Uh, he's my non-exec chairman. Uh, and you'll hear about Jinder Lee there. Uh, myself, I'm a geologist, uh, 20 years experience and uh, former sell side analyst for a few years in Western Australia and uh, Liza Carpine, who's our, uh, our company uh, non-exec director, but she's also former company secretary for Northern Star and current uh, non-exec for, for Mincor. You can see the, uh, the share price there, actions run up quite hard recently, uh, largely as a result of our, uh, our lithium anomalism that we've identified at Coroni, and I'll, I'll run you through that briefly in a moment. Um, just looking at Coroni, this is our project in Western Australia. It's, it's about 110 kilometres east of Kalgoorlie on the uh, Trans Access Road, which is the uh, the road that carries the Indian Pacific Railway. So uh, that road bisects our property. It's, it's a big wide road, all weather, all year. Uh, it gives us uh, telephone access all year round and is largely what I call champagne exploration. It's, uh, it's a lovely spot to be because it's very easy to get to. Uh, we have two projects there. We've got Coroni in the south and, uh, and that is largely historically been explored for gold. Uh, it's 90 kilometers, uh, 90 kilometers of uh, continuous strike with a, an operating gold mine sitting in the middle of it that's owned by uh, Silver Lake Resources. And uh, we have 111,000 ounce made in gold resource there, which we released um, late last year. Uh, Lake Rebecca in the north, 
Uh, this is under application at the moment, and this sits among the giants of the uh, Caruso Dam, which is a couple, you know, four and a half million ounce gold deposit and uh, one and a bit million ounce gold deposit at uh, Rebecca to the east of there that's owned by Remelius. So we're sandwiched in between those guys. It's a big ground position uh, and uh, it's dominated by the likes of uh, Alchemy. Our neighbours are Ozorum and uh, Nexus are all in, also in that neck of the woods and uh, never ever been explored for lithium either. Um, just looking at Crony, zooming in on there, you can see in the centre of the, uh, the picture there, the, uh, the Aldus mine that's owned by Silver Lake Resources and they currently do open pit mining there. And uh, we have all the ground around them there. And you can see some of the, the colorful images, just the uh, high resolution magnetics that we flew uh, late last year. And we're trying to look for these big ridges in here, which is the uh, high iron dolerites that we're targeting as the host rock in the region. So it's a function of getting in there and drilling with, with better gear than has been done previously. Uh, a lot of the previous explorers in the 1980s to 2000s were using uh, lower power drill rigs. And we went in there with a lot more powerful, more modern equipment. And we're having a bit of a win there as well, uh, looking to try and get below that younger cover. And uh, no one had ever done that before successfully, which is uh, it's good for us. Further south, we've got our uh, Gilmore target, which we're currently drilling. And um, we're just testing some greenfield targets on there based on the new data that we're getting. And uh, we think we're having a bit of a win. Just uh, zooming in on the Corona East area there, that's just next to Silver Lake. Um, I don't know whether you can see a lot of the grey dots there is all the historic RAB drilling that didn't actually have any uh, results in them and then we've come in there with our uh, air core rig a lot more powerful piece of equipment got through that sort of problematic younger cover uh, near surface calcrease and alluvials and we punched through and we're getting two meters of 2.7 meter at 5.24 meter at 2.34 gold um, they're reasonable results they're all in the clays and we've yet to test the bedrock source of that and we intend to uh, to get in there and do that very shortly as part of that that drill program that's currently underway so uh, it's nice to see a lot of big targets there as well. You can see on the right hand side, there's a four and a half common zone of, of anomalism and largely never been tested uh, with modern methods. Similarly, on the, uh, the northern area in map one, it's about a thousand metres long of, uh, of anomalism too. So there's lots to test and, and lots to drill. Perhaps the most important and uh, most exciting development for uh, alchemy recently has been the, uh, the discovery of very, very large lithium anomalism on our tenements. Uh, as you can see up here in the, uh, the corner, there's the Manan Lithium Deposit, and that's owned by Global Lithium Resources. It's about 10 million tonnes of just over 1% lithium and uh, 49 ppm tantalum. And uh, they started drilling today. They, uh, they've, I think it's a 16,000 metre RC program and a, a 6,000 metre core program, uh, and we are a long strike of them. Uh, we share the same sort of terrain in that the granite is uh, very similar down our way. And we've developed uh, a couple of very early days uh, anomalies up there. One of them is over here on the right, just in next to our existing gold deposit uh, with the Pecan, Mesquite, Hickory and uh, Cherry projects, uh, prospects. And that's about seven kilometres by one kilometres long. And on the left, uh, there's Rogue Hills and there's multiple anomalies there, about eight k's a piece uh, with a lot still to test. So um, yeah, we've been out there ground truthing. Uh, I think I've got another map here, which I can show. Uh, and this is over the Cherry to Hickory and Pecan and Mesquite anomalies. Uh, it's within this thing called the Goldilocks zone, which is the area that is prospective for LCT pegmatites. Now, we went out there and we've mapped pegmatites on there. And uh, the, Global, uh, the Geological Survey of Western Australia had never mapped pegmatites here before. Uh, there would never been anything mapped of any kind before. And it's actually it was listed as being mafic rocks like basalts and dolerites. And uh, our ground truthing discovered multiple anomalies over this seven kilometre stretch, just as an initial sort of main sort of area of discovery. So. Uh, we've been in there mapping, as you can see, there's sort of the green areas in here as the map pegmatites of over a kilometre long uh, and a few sort of outcropping areas here, which look quite, uh, quite nice as well. And uh, we're just getting in there with more soil sampling, more mapping and just getting boots on ground to go and assess this. Uh, we'll stress that this has never been uh, explored for lithium before, but uh, all the indicators that we've had from our geochemist uh, suggest that this is the exactly the right spot to be looking for this kind of stuff. Just further afield, this is the entire tenement package that uh, Alchemy owns in the Coroni area. So this area, sort of that big orange area there is about 50 kilometers long. It's untested for lithium. It's always been a gold province or base metals, but never for lithium. And as you can see, the original targets, I was just seeing the seven kilometer long zone up there is just that area there. We've got 15 other targets to test based on our existing data. And uh, we'll hopefully be starting regional soil sampling uh, within the next few weeks. Uh, to go and test all these areas down here and really, really give this a red hot go in terms of uh, assessing its potential. Um, moving north to uh, the Briar Basin up near Plutonic, we have our JVs with uh, Superior Gold and, and Sandfire Resources. 
Uh, they're a free carried interest. The, uh, the, the superior gold one is free carried to production and then uh, cost of uh, production are, are repaid from a uh, no interest loan. So effectively, we don't have uh, any sort of management of this. It's all taken care of by the companies themselves. We own 20% of those both. And uh, the Hermes South one could deliver cash flow to uh, Alchemy shareholders at some stage. And they're assessing that for um, that potential at the moment and uh, doing further exploration, which is great. And Sandfire just keeps plugging away, drilling thousand sort of air holes a year and doing a basin analysis and uh, some very, very high level and smart work there as well. So it's great to be free carried with some big players. Um, just going to New South Wales, we've got a bunch of high quality projects there uh, at Yellow Mountain, Overflow, Melrose and West Lynn. Um, they all sit near or proximal to the Gilmore Suture. And you can see on there, I've put the uh, icons of other companies in the area. It's a, it's a cast of thousands. The Helix has done really, really well. Aurelia, Peel Mining, uh, Alcane, Glencore and, uh, and Triton with Eris as well. Uh, some great names and some really good work being done. And we're right in the thick of that thing. Um, we have a number of projects there that are very well advanced. Obviously, Yellow Mountain and Melrose. And we're looking to try and draw those uh, later this year. Overflow, pre-resource, high-grade gold, and Westland, perhaps the most important one is a HPA, a high-purity alumina and nickel cobalt resource. We already have about 21 million tonnes at 0.84 nickel and 0.05 cobalt. So just working at Yellow Mountain, this is uh, historic uh, copper gold workings that haven't been drilled since 1986. Uh, results such as, you know, sort of 24 metres at 1% copper, 1% lead, 1% zinc from surface. Uh, as you can see the results on the side there, 52 metres at half a gram gold and 0.3 copper. None of these have been followed up. A lot of the modern methods haven't really been testing this thing for the last 40 years, and we intend to do that uh, as near term as possible. There's some grab samples on there that were taken around the mine shaft area, so they're not in situ, not representative, but uh, coming up at 7.5% copper, 6.5% lead. So there's some very serious mineralisation there. We've just got to go and try and understand it. Uh, we've done a heritage survey on this and we're trying to lock in uh, land access agreements as we speak to uh, to get in there. At Overflow, it's about 20 kilometres north of Yellow Mountain. There's a pre-resource area up there of uh, multiple zones of high grade mineralisation. You can see the purple dots in here. Um, 10 metres at 4.5 gold, 3% zinc. Again, down here, 7 metres at 6.7 gold, 1.9% zinc. Um, really, it's a function of more drill testing and uh, we'll get there and drill these along strike. And at depth, as with most Cobar systems, they develop at depth and uh, we'll aim to drill those sometime later this year. Uh, obviously being COVID related delays and all the border lockouts have uh, prevented us from getting in there, but we're, uh, we're very eager to go and get in there as soon as possible. Um, moving less more north to West Lynn, which is up near Ningen, um, uh, we have a nickel cobalt resource of 21 million tonnes of 0.84 nickel, 0.05 cobalt, which is very, very relevant in today's uh, uh, base metals boom and battery metals boom. And perhaps most important is this 7 million tonne at 21% alumina resource. Now, you process that through a metallurgical, metallurgical test work and you can get what's called high purity alumina, which is used in uh, synthetic sapphire glasses and they're starting to use those in batteries as a cathode uh, or a, a separator in batteries as well now. So there's a very important and very high value resource here uh, that we aim to assess and we've got a strategic review underway to go and assess what further work we need to do there, more metallurgy, increased resource drilling and whatnot. So where are we at? Um, Coroni, it's a very aggressive timeline. Uh, at Coroni, we've got Aircore and RC drilling. We've completed one already at Coroni East. We're currently drilling Gilmore and uh, the second program. We aim to drill a third program uh, later this year. In the meantime, we've got a second stream of lithium exploration ongoing at Pecan, Hickory, Cherry and Mesquite, as well as regional soils. So we'll do those in con concurrently with the gold exploration. Uh, the Briar, J uh, Briar Basin JV does tend to look after itself. So that's ongoing and continuous. And in uh, Cobar Basin, we've completed the Yellow Mountain Heritage Survey. We've got the land access agreements uh, being negotiated now, and we'll hope to drill that sometime mid-year, and then look to try and fit in overflow drilling shortly after that, in, uh, hopefully in Q4, uh, pending rig availability. So yesterday, I guess it was, the enterprise value was about 24, a little bit higher today. We are highly leveraged to exploration success. Briar Basin JV, it's uh, free carried. We don't really have any management there, but it's uh, got some very, very smart people doing work for us. We've got the battery metals optionality with West Lynn uh, and the, the Cobar Basin, obviously very, very high tenor. Copper gold porphyries at Yellow Mountain, overflow, pre-resource area that could be toll treated down the road at any one of a number of mines and Coroni very, very aggressively at that to, uh, to discover and uh, see what it's about and uh, in very, very close proximity to an existing deposit who's uh, just up the road to us. So yeah, that's it. Um, uh, thank you everybody for your time today and uh, yes, my name is James and uh, yeah, chat soon.
Uh, James, thank you so much for that presentation. Of course, we will get your thoughts a little further. We can uh, just delve into all that knowledge you do have. Of course, you mentioned their 20 years of experience, so that'll be part of our rapid fire round. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions there, but thank you once again for the presentation. All right, thanks, James. Well, let's keep pushing forward now. Our third guest speaker for today is the Exploration Manager of C29 Metals Limited. Namely, that's Dave Nelson. Now, David is a member of the Australian Institute of Geoscientists and is an integral cog in the work of C29 Metals. C29 Metals itself is a copper-focused ASX-listed mineral explorer with significant exposure to copper projects in prominent mining jurisdictions. And to shed some light on those jurisdictions and a whole heap more, I now allow Dave to take the virtual stage. Dave, welcome to Calkine Media's InvestNest webinar. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. And apologies to anyone who was expecting to hear from our executive director, Mark Major, today. He's um, unfortunately not available, so I'll be taking you through the slides we won't dwell on this other than to say that we will be making some uh, forward-looking statements today which are not guarantees of future performance. Now this is C29, an overview. We're a fairly new company. We only listed in November last year. Fairly small market cap. We are a copper-focused explorer. We have three granted projects. Um, that's the Stadler's project in WA and the Samson's Tank and Reedy Creek projects in New South Wales. Uh, we also have a series of applications on projects in South Australia, uh, the Torrens Group of Tenements, and we have a option on a highly prospective project called Mayfield in Queensland. This is the, um, the brains trust behind C29. These are the people steering the ship. Mark Major is a um, very experienced geologist with an MBA, more than 25 years experience. And he is uh, my mentor here at C29. Then we have uh, David Lees, our chairman, more than 20 years experience in finance. And uh, finishing off the mix is Mr. Ed Haynes, both a geologist and a financier and a very useful part of our team. Now, I think that um, C29 represents a great investment opportunity. We've got a clear strategy focus on high-grade, low-cost exploration targets. We have high-quality projects in known mineral camps, um, targets that have a lot of potential. And uh, we have a board that's alert to new opportunities, whether that's through project generation or acquisition of more projects. Um, our strategy is to focus on underexplored discoveries and we think that copper is a, a excellent metal to be exploring for in the current time. Prices are high, demand is strong, um, it's only going to go one way. And specifically to C29, we have a pretty low enterprise value at the minute with strong potential for growth. I guess the next few slides we're going to lay out how we intend to grow that. So here's a slightly more in-depth overview of our projects. Mayfield is a project that um, we've become involved with in the last few months. We don't currently have ownership of the project. We have an option to acquire it. Pending renewal of the license, we will be acquiring this project shortly. Uh, Mayfield is located less than 100 kilometers from Mount Isa. It's a one of the best addresses you could imagine if you want to explore for base metals. The tenement in particular has two very profitable mines essentially bracketing the tenement. We've got the Tick Hill Gold Mine, one and a half kilometres to the south. That was a um, 400,000 ounce deposit with a, a head grade of 28 grams per tonne, which is pretty exceptional. On the property, we have the Trekulano Copper Mine, which is no longer in production, but again, was a very profitable deposit in its day. Some of our neighbours nearby have had a lot of success in recent times, um, doing essentially what we intend to do at Mayfield, looking over ground that hasn't had much modern exploration, uh, applying new geophysical techniques, more systematic drilling campaigns. So Hammer Metals, they have uh, made a discovery at Kalman and uh, Calumby Resources also doing well with their um, new Desperandum or Greater Duchess project. Within Mayfield itself, we've got extensive near surface mineralization associated with magnetic anomalies. Uh, it's a IOCG type target. The previous drilling has been 
quite sparse, limited to shallow holes. Uh, in, in my opinion, it's likely to have been ineffective and that leaves us with a lot of opportunity to come back to this ground and uh, do better, essentially. So the previous exploration here followed a pattern of soil sampling over uh, magnetic highs and then following up any soil anomalies with, with shallow drilling. But the project is known to have uh, transported alluvial cover more than 80% of the project area, which makes um, soil geochemical sampling problematic at times. Uh, we think that it can it can miss things, it can cause people to focus in the wrong areas. Have a look at Mayfield using some sub magnetics and potentially also IP geophysics, just to um, highlight these areas where there's been IOCG type alteration. Uh, and then we would like to go back to those targets and carry some more systematic drilling um, not purely focusing on known prospects or, or existing named anomalies. Of the anomalies that have been looked at in the past, this helps to depth of exploration that's taken place. The, the Clary's prospect has a magnetic anomaly, a soil anomaly coincident with it, and it sits at the intersection of multiple structures. We've had some excellent drill results, drill results there in the past, um, but the project has only been drilled to a maximum depth of 85 metres. Uh, Maiden Creek's another similar target, again a multi-element soil anomaly, magnetic high, multiple structures converging in that area. You can see their best drilling intersection, one metre at 3.4% zinc with a, a whole host of other minerals associated with it. Uh, again, it's only been drilled to just over 100 metres. And other comparable prospects have had even less work completed on them. Significant amounts of the historical exploration data only exists on scanned paper. It's never previously been digitized and that's something that we have um, slightly surprised by but also we have now begun the process of digitizing that. So we we're hoping that we're able to take some steps forward with this project quite quickly once we get the uh, license renewed and move forward with the option. Next project I'd like to discuss is Reedy Creek in New South Wales. It's um, in the lock and fold belt. It's a polymetallic scan target. It also has potential for epithermal gold. There is a historical copper mine on site. There has been a lot of drilling in and around this project in the past. You can see some results listed there. 12 meters over 1% copper. From our recent drilling that we completed earlier this year, we had 31 meters of over 1% zinc. The mineralization is, is complex. It appears to be open along strike and at depth to improve our understanding of it, but that's essentially what we've been doing and what we intend to continue doing there. Uh, a recently developed geological model, what was going on there relative to the state government geological mapping, you know, essentially threw us off to begin with. It's what is mapped is not what we have uh, encountered. So that's a bit of a challenge, but we've got over that. Uh, we completed over a thousand meters of diamond drilling between December last year and March of this. I mentioned previous slide that we had 31 meters of over 1% zinc in one of our drill holes. We also had some pretty interesting gold and copper intersections elsewhere within the project. Our geology model, our understanding of the mineralization has significantly advanced as a result of this drilling and planning for further work is currently underway at Reedy Creek. As well as the Reedy Creek mine area, we also have um, some other targets within the tenement package. So there is a known gold target called Kala with a 1.8 kilometer long uh, soil gold anomaly. This has never been drilled before. The intention is later in this year, once land access negotiations are completed, we would like to get out there, do some orientation drilling, most likely air core, and just gauge the size and tenor of the gold anomaly. We recently identified this one from historical soil data. It sits in a great structural position. It's between two, two large faults. Seems to be a magnetic trend linking those two faults exactly where the, the, the soil anomaly is. Uh, again, no drilling. We need to get in there. We want to drill, drill test that with air core and uh, try and move that one forward. And the other uh, parts of the project listed here, Reedy Creek and Endeavour, they um, they essentially extensions of the known mineralization from the Reedy Creek mine itself. Um, we have 
built there earlier this year, as I mentioned. We are now looking to define a, a design sub audio magnetic survey there. Next project to discuss again in New South Wales, this is the Samson's Tank project located very close to Tottenham, the town of Tottenham, and also the uh, Loxley Resources Tottenham copper deposit. Um, it's prospective for Beshi type volcanogenic massive sulfides. Uh, we have two very strong targets within the Samson's Tank project. Um, one never drilled before, the other uh, has been drilled and offers some encouragement for, for deeper drilling or further work. Well, briefly, that's our, our neighbours in the area. We have Loxley Resources directly to the south with a 7 million tonnes at 1.2% copper. Helix to our north, the Colorina Discovery. They've had some excellent results from that. So we're definitely in a, in a good address there. And when you focus on uh, Samson's tank itself. We have three fairly coherent soil copper anomalies. Two of those correspond very well with uh, magnetic anomalies. We've recently flown a, a VTEM survey over this area to look for basement conductors. We have not yet got the final interpretation, so we're not able to discuss that, but we're hoping that that will help with our targeting. Once we have that on board, we will look to again get some scout drilling, some some probably most likely air core, potentially RC over this prospect and see if we can move forward here. A compelling target, everything lines up very well. The size of the anomalies, the P47 to the north of the map there, uh, more than one kilometer long soil, soil anomaly, copper and gold, somewhat other pathfinder elements that are also elevated there. Uh, again, P54, the, the anomaly at the bottom of the screen, almost one by one kilometre. The final project that I will talk about today is known as Stadler's. This is in Western Australia, 60 kilometres south of Parabardu. Um, I was just looking at the, the previous presentation. I think we might be neighbours. We have a lot of potential again here. You can see some excellent rock chip results, double figures of uh, copper percentage. Only six drill holes on the whole tenement. Um, one of them has returned five meters at almost 3% copper. The geochemical sampling that's been done lines up very well with the structural interp and the mapped geology. There's some great targets there in, in the center of the tenement that you can see. There's also a, a large series of mapped gossens on the western side. I've called them forgotten gossen. They have never been subjected to any uh, geophysics, any geochemical sampling, uh, despite the other gossens within the tenement returning some pretty good numbers. So there is a lot of potential here. I'm planning to get some boots on the ground on this tenement next month, uh, get out and just assess the access, um, do some more mapping to refine what's been mapped already. Uh, and just to scope out how we would be able to move this one forward. Again, I'd like to get out there with a drill rig and start systematically testing some of these uh, structures, some of these opportunities, we just have to make sure that it's it's practical to get out and actually do that. This summarizes our key price drivers for C29. We have geophysics to be completed at Mayfield. Once that's interpreted, we'd like to get out and do drilling there. With Weedy Creek, the Sunview and Cala prospects, again, need to be drilled. Uh, we also have further work to do around the Reedy Creek mine and Endeavour themselves. The Airborne EM for Samson Tank, that's already been completed. As I said, we're awaiting interpretation on that. And then we would like to get out and, and get drilling. Uh, the next one there, granting of the Torrens projects, that's our South Australian applications. We're hoping that they are gonna come through this quarter. And then we'll have a lot of work to do generating targets there. But again, that looks like a, um, very interesting spot to do some more work. Here's the timeline of how we'd like to do that. I don't need to read out every single item, but you can see that the second half of 2022 looks very busy. Um, we essentially want to work on, get work going on all of these tenements if we can, uh, and start really digging down and seeing what we've got there. And that's just a list of relevant ASX announcements for all the data that we've previously discussed, okay. 
and that is the end. Thank you. And thanks so much for that presentation, and especially for stepping in as well on short notice. I know there's a lot to go through and you did a fantastic job there of just giving us a little bit of an insight into exactly what's happening. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, well, last but not least, we have now arrived at Lindsay, who, of course, has been uh, juggling a couple of commitments so far this morning over where he is and has done a great job for us as well to make sure that he is free today. So let me introduce you officially to Lindsay Dudfield, who is the Executive Director of Jindalee Resources. He's also a geologist with more than 40 years of experience in multi-commodity exploration, primarily within Australia, and he's also been responsible for managing Jindalee since its inception, along with working for the likes of Exxon. Now, he is also a member of the Australian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, the Geological Society of Australia, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists, and the Society of Economic Geologists. In other words, he is heavily credentialed. Jindalee itself is an Australian headquartered exploration company with direct and indirect exposure to lithium, gold, base and strategic metals, iron ore, uranium, magnesite, and also many, many other interesting developments that they are currently endeavouring to undertake. And of course, to take us through all of those and give us a bit of an insight into Jindalee itself and potentially some of his experience as well, I'd now like to throw it over to Lindsay Dudfield. Lindsay, thanks so much for being here today with us. Yeah, thanks very much, James. Thanks for that introduction and uh, welcome to all your investors who've joined the webinar. Hopefully we can uh, provide a, at least a brief overview of Jinder Lee uh, for you. And uh, if there's uh, uh, further information that you need, uh, either contact uh, me directly or, or have a look at our website or ASX announcements. So the, the cover page here uh, is a photograph of our lead project, the McDermott Lithium Project. Uh, it's 100% owned by Jindalee through its US subsidiary. It's the second largest uh, lithium deposit in the United States. It's a sediment hosted deposit, which formed in the inside a, a crater lake uh, or, or inside a caldera, a volcanic crater. Uh, the rim of the crater you can see on the, the skyline there, it's called the McDermott uh, caldera. And the, the mineralization itself is uh, at the top of it anyway, outcrops and, and it's these low colored uh, hills that are enriched in, in, as I said, in lithium. Um, just a couple of things to note here. This area has had a long history of both ranching. Uh, so the, the local um, ranchers run their cattle uh, through the uh, sagebush uh, in the spring uh, and also mining. It's got, uh, there are historic uh, uh, mercury mines. For example, this was, a, this was a, a large mercury mining center from about the 1940s through to the 1990s. And, and just outside of our tenements, uh, these are waste dumps for, uh, from a mercury mining. So you've got tracks, fence lines, uh, you know, a lot of access, which we've been able to use uh, in our exploration drilling to date to minimize our uh, impact on the environment. Obligatory disclaimer, uh, this was prepared a couple of weeks ago. We're updating our presentation currently, so there should be a fresh one uh, lodged on ASX. Uh, could be next week. Uh, but but uh, basically, the metrics are, are pretty well unchanged from a couple of weeks ago. In fact, actually, our share price has dropped a little, so we've actually got a little bit cheaper for those looking to enter. Um, just under 60 million shares on issue. We've been listed almost 20 years, 20 uh, years in, in July. Uh, and because we're a project generator, we haven't issued many shares. So that, you know, there's been no um, uh, consolidation or whatever. That is uh, a genuine, uh, you know, sort of uh, small number of issued capital uh, since uh, since listing in, in July 2002. Right? We're actually also one of the very few explorers that's paid a fully frank dividend. We paid a 55 cent fully frank dividend. Uh, uh, to shareholders uh, late 2009 and we've also offered our shareholders opportunities to participate in, in spin outs uh, which have uh, been uh, very attractive for um, for generally shareholders so market cap uh, uh, at uh, the middle of the month just under 200 million at the end of the march quarter just under eight uh, sorry nine million in in cash uh, and about another four and a half just under in, in liquid investments. These are shares and companies that we have either spun out or divested projects to. Uh, so, um, you know, the enterprise value of around, just around $185 million is, is, uh, is, you'll see later on, very cheap relative to our, uh, our peers, um, particularly given the size of the uh, McDermott project. 
Uh, I'm the largest shareholder. I founded the company prior to listing. I've never sold a share. I've only bought. Uh, we're a project generator, as I said. So we, uh, we're, we're very geologically driven. We look to acquire prospective ground, add value uh, using relatively uh, uh, low, low cost and targeted exploration uh, methods. And then we reach a decision point. Do we, do we divest the project either by selling it or bringing in a partner? Uh, and we've, you know, we've used both of those, uh, uh, if you like, methods to, to uh, retain an interest in the project while having other parties, uh, you know, take some of the exploration risk. Or do we move the project forward under our own, uh, 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 under our own management? And this is what we've done with uh, McDermott and also a couple of our uh, West Australian projects I'll touch on later, uh, because we believe both of those um, McDermott and also our particularly our Widgie Mortha um, project near Kalgoorlie uh, are potentially transforming projects for the company. Uh, the board, Justin Manalini is our chairman. He's a lawyer with merchant banking experience and was till recently uh, a director on the Northern Australian Infrastructure Fund. Uh, I'm a geologist, uh, as, as James said, uh, founded the company uh, way back when. Uh, Trish has been with us uh, just after a week after we listed uh, on ASX. Karen's been with us uh, over 18 months uh, now. She is a, a geologist with uh, uh, resource uh, and mining experience. I'm more of a greenfield project generation sort of guy. Uh, and uh, Jimmy is uh, managing our uh, exploration here in, in uh, Western Australia. Uh, and we've just taken on Brett Marsh. Uh, he's based in the US. Uh, he is uh, full time with us. He is building the team in the United States to advance McDermott. Uh, and he comes from a big company background, uh, very experienced in, in, in the mining and exploration, uh, but also with um, uh, some junior uh, exposure as well. Uh, so we're kind of a schizophrenic company. As I said, we've got assets in, uh, in, in the US and assets in Australia. Uh, and what you'll see here, and it's the most important uh, message, probably one of the most important messages of this presentation, is we're in the process of demerging the, the Australian assets. We expect that process to be finished by the end of September. Uh, and uh, generally shareholders will receive a free share pro rata in the, in the spin out company, uh, yet to be named, but um, uh, that process is well underway. Uh, and and Karen will be and, and Jimmy will be the executive team uh, managing the, uh, the the new Australian ASX listed company. So that's something to keep an eye uh, out for. And why are we doing this? Because we believe that uh, Jindalee's market capitalisation currently contains no credit uh, for, or there's no value ascribed to our Australian assets, and we need to fix that up. Uh, so lithium, uh, you know, everyone pretty well knows the lithium story. The market's uh, in deficit. The the um, uh, the lithium uh, price has 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 been uh, accelerating rapidly o over the last uh, six months or so, um, and uh, you know it's forecast to continue to be in deficit for you know for decades. Um, the important thing about our McDermott project is in the United States. Uh, there's bipartisan support for the development of critical minerals, including lithium uh, projects in, in the US. Uh, and President Biden has pledged an enormous amount of money to the electrification of the United States to, to achieve net zero by 2050. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a very strong uh, domestic tailwind for lithium projects in the United States. Um, and, you know, it, the head of the Department of, of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, is a huge uh, supporter of domestic uh, production of, of lithium to feed a domestic uh, battery uh, industry, obviously for, for EVs and for energy storage as well. So in March, there were some several political developments uh, that were very positive, we believe, for, for our uh, US assets, lithium assets. Uh, the, the project is on the uh, Oregon-Nevada border and, and early March, uh, one of the uh, Democrat senators from Oregon introduced uh, legislation that says there to support uh, production of um, critical minerals uh, in the United States. Uh, that was followed a few days later by a bar bipartisan uh, a letter written to uh, uh, President Biden urging him to invoke the Defence Production Act 
Uh, and um, uh, the last day of, of March, uh, he did indeed invoke the DPA uh, to accelerate production of battery metals, including lithium in the United States. And the, the, the DPA, just for, for, your, for your viewers, was originally uh, invoked during the Korean War to, to uh, help the war effort uh, secure uh, critical uh, materials uh, for the war. So it's a, a pretty powerful act. So really this will be about McDermott. We have a, an early, uh, earlier stage exploration play called um, uh, Clayton North, which is in Nevada. Uh, but the McDermott is, is, is really the, the jewel in the crown for, uh, currently for, um, for Jin, Jinder Lee. Um, the, uh, the project sits, as I said, just over the border uh, in Oregon. Uh, it's uh, owned 100%. Uh, this uh, is within the McDermott Caldera, that's the yellow uh, dashed line there. Uh, and uh, at, we're at the northern end of the Caldera, as you can see, at the southern end of the Caldera is the largest lithium deposit in the United States currently. That's the Thacker Pass deposit that's owned by a company called Lithium Americas. They're listed on uh, TSX and the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so we, we discovered this, uh, this uh, deposit, uh, we pegged it, uh, you know, staked the claims, 100% owned, as I said, by our US subsidiary uh, in uh, uh, the second quarter of 2018, after doing initial uh, geochemical sampling in the area. Uh, did our first drilling program, a four hole uh, proof of concept type drilling uh, in uh, September 2018, and um, basically intersected broad widths of lithium mineralization in all four holes. Uh, and we've continued to go back each year and drill more holes and, and advance the project to the point, as it says there, where it's currently one of the largest lithium deposits in the United States uh, with a, an inferred and indicated uh, resource of about 1.4 billion tonnes of 1320 ppm lithium. Uh, and it's the, the, the sediments are flat lying, as you saw in the title slide, uh, they're, they're relatively soft. So they're amenable to, to uh, low cost uh, mining uh, and, um, and we've achieved excellent uh, metallurgical uh, recoveries using uh, sulfuric acid leach. And we're also looking at alternative methods currently. So just a summary of the, of the resource at the 1000 ppm cutoff, as I said, 1.43 uh, billion tonnes at 1320, which gives us contained lithium carbonate equivalent of 10.1 million tonnes. There's also a very large exploration target that uh, surrounds the uh, indicated and inferred resource. I should say that the indicated resource is in yellow and the inferred is in red. Uh, and uh, in areas here where there's been no drilling whatsoever, but where we can see the sediments uh, outcropping, we uh, uh, you'll see in subsequent slides, we're going to be drill testing that in September and we expect that uh, uh, any uh, would be unlucky not to get mineralization in, in that uh, step out drilling. Uh, we completed a, a scoping study in um, September 2021. Unfortunately, because of a, a reliance on inferred resource, uh, the ASX redacted most of the useful information uh, in the study uh, in our announcement. Uh, but what I can tell you is that the, that the uh, it was cash flow positive, and that was based on a uh, lithium carbonate price of eleven thousand dollars a ton. It's currently around seventy thousand dollars a ton. So you can imagine if it was positive at such a low price, it, it would yeah you know, absolutely looks fantastic at current prices. Um, you know we uh, optimised the open pits to uh, to maximise the early uh, return uh, for the project. Uh, we had a, you know, started with a resource grade, as you saw, of 1320, but the actual uh, grade uh, delivered to, um, the diluted grade delivered to the to the plant was uh, close to 1800 ppm, a, a, a low waste ore ratio, as you'd expect, given it sticks out of the ground and it's, you know, very continuous. Uh, and um, so basically, even though we weren't able to release all the information we wanted to, it certainly has informed uh, our infill drilling, and, and that's we realise that's what we have to do to uh, infill the resource, convert inferred to indicated, and then be in a position to to uh, restate the scoping study based on um, the right mix, if you like, of resource uh, to to satisfy ASX requirements.
Uh, and we weren't able to also say the life of mine, but we were able to, to mention that uh, it, the project has the potential to supply lithium carbonate and also um, uh, fertiliser uh, to US to the US for, for decades, for decades and decades. It's a potentially a very long life uh, mine. So uh, we drilled uh, 12 holes in December uh, and we uh, released the, the results um, from those. Uh, one of the holes was abandoned, as you can see down here, uh, 32 metres, but the other 11 uh, completed uh, their way from surface to the basement, uh, which is a volcanic basement. So the mineralised sediments are sitting here. You can see that there's a vertical exaggeration here of uh, five times. So these holes are about 500 metres apart. Uh, the, these holes here form part of the uh, in indicated resource. And you can see there's very good continuity from, from hole to hole over, over significant uh, widths. Uh, so the holes that were drilled uh, in December, the, these are the holes shown with the blue circles. Uh, and, and the remaining holes, all of the holes here with the open white circles, they're the holes that are permitted. There's 28 of them to be completed in the September quarter. Uh, we've got a written book, the deposit's paid. We met the drillers in uh, Reno two or three weeks ago. They're on, on track to commence drilling uh, in September as planned. And, and so we, uh, they'll be double shifting and we expect to complete that program pretty quickly and have results coming into the market, uh, you know, probably November, given the turnaround of, of uh, assay results in the US. So pretty exciting, you know, and, and particularly I'm really excited about the drilling these wildcat holes out to the west to see if they can uh, extend the, the resource uh, further. So uh, a peer comparison, the the uh, vertical axis is the tons of resource, the uh, horizontal axis is the grade, the size of the bubble indicates the the um, contained uh, LCE. So as I said, Thacker Pass, currently the largest lithium deposit in the United States is 18.1 million tons of lithium carbonate equivalent. McDermott's the second largest with 10.1. Just comparison of uh, market caps uh, as of uh, uh, you know the middle of uh, middle of the month, and you can see uh, you know under any uh, any sort of uh, valuation metric, we we are undervalued compared to our peers. Um, what are, if you take the advanced projects out of this uh, and just concentrate on the if you like the emerging projects, uh, so ourselves. Um, Clayton Valley uh, project, which is owned by uh, Cyprus, uh, the Tonopah project owned by um, uh, American Lithium, uh, and the Big Sandy project owned by uh, Arizona Lithium. The average price, or the market is valuing those companies, the, their resources at an average of four hundred and fourteen uh, dollars a ton uh, per per ton of lithium carbonate, uh, and McDermott is currently valued by the market at about nineteen dollars eighty a ton of lithium carbonate. If we were valued at the same price that uh, the other, the average of those uh, three peers is, at, say $414 a ton, our share price would be about $72. Now, look, I'm not saying we're going to get to $72, but it does indicate uh, how undervalued the company is. So McDermott, what's going on there? We've, we've commenced the infill drilling, as you saw, we commenced it in December. Uh, we're, we're recommencing it in, in, and finishing it in, in uh, September, the September end of the September quarter. There's metallurgical test work going on in, in Perth as we speak, uh, and also uh, samples are likely to be shipped to third parties for uh, independent testing. Uh, these are potential off takers. Um, uh, environmental studies have been accelerated uh, when we were there on the ground, uh, you know, earlier this month that there were uh, biologists uh, crawling all over the project to uh, uh, commence the permitting, uh, permitting uh, project permitting process. Um, we have recently appointed, as I said, uh, Brett Marsh as our VP uh, Exploration, and we're also looking to appoint um, uh, US-based uh, directors to the company as we separate uh, the Australian assets from Jinder Lee and Jinder Lee becomes a pure play uh, US lithium company. And as I said, we're engaging with potential uh, partners, uh, end users, etc. cetera, uh, at, ongoing all the time. Uh, we, we explore um, uh, very responsibly. Uh, we limit our, our uh, impact on the environment. Uh, we we re rehabilitate the holes at the end of each program. Um, and uh, we uh, 
even though the area, as I said, has a has, you know a long history of, of mining and, and ranching, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we we uh, leave uh, the environment uh, in as you know a similar sort of shape to what it was when we arrived. And and as I said, we're also building a, 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 our community engagement in the United States, which which is a very important part of of uh, you know potentially getting a large project like this uh, uh, into development. Just to touching on the Australian assets, the uh, Widgee Milther project, this will be the lead project in the spin out, a thousand square kilometres, 100% owned, uh, surrounded by operating nickel mines, gold mines. Uh, there's uh, also uh, lithium uh, mines and a, a mined out cesium uh, deposit uh, that's owned by Essential uh, Metals there. They've also made a, a lithium discovery up here uh, and, and the, basically the western side of the, the Pioneer Dome basically trends right through our EL here. Uh, we think this is really prospective for, for for gold, for nickel, and for for lithium. And you know this will be a key focus of the spin out company. Just uh, some nickel targeting. We've already started. There's some walk up drill uh, uh, targets already been generated. So uh, in summary, look, you know McDermott is a world class lithium deposit. There's no two ways about it. It's huge, and it's going to get bigger with uh, uh, with the the drilling that we've got coming up. Uh, in uh, in September, uh, it's amenable to bulk uh, mining, as we you know demonstrated from our uh, preliminary scoping study. Uh, and because of its scale, it does have the potential to materially uh, uh, impact on US uh, lithium supply, which is a, a good thing because they're going to need a hell of a lot of lithium uh, to meet their uh, their forecast EV production. Um, we have a track record of, of creating value for our shareholders. As I said, we've paid a fully frank dividend. We've spun out companies that have made a lot of money for shareholders in the past. Uh, there's a new, the new spin out coming and, and we believe that'll be also very attractive for shareholders. And we've got skin in the game. We, we think like shareholders, uh, you know, and, and so uh, investors can be confident that we're going to do the right thing by shareholders because we are significant shareholders ourselves. And as I said, you know, the spin out, uh, we should complete that demerger by the end of the September quarter, and there'll be a free share to Jindalee shareholders, uh, further details to be announced. So for further information, either give us a call, uh, send us an email, or, or just go and have a look on our website and, and, and look at our ASX announcements and, and uh, very happy to uh, take any questions. Lindsay, thank you so much for that, mate. And I'm sure there will be plenty of questions. We've got a few that have come through, which I've now collated myself. So let's uh, let's get stuck in now for the rapid fire round. I'll get all of our guest speakers to now turn on your cameras as well. And if there are any further questions that pop through, of course, you do have the Q&A box there and also the chat box for any of our attendees who want to add further questions to what we do already have. But let's start with uh, Corey. Corey Nolan, let's begin with the question that is, who is your inspiration and why? Oh, tricky question. Um, look, I, I, I'm inspired by, um, you know, geologists in our business like, um, you know, Mark Creasy, um, you know, people like that, that, um, you know, look at things, take, explore them systematically, um, but are prepared to, um, to, you know, to take big risks, drilling, uh, you know, targets where there's no surface expression rely, relying, uh, you know, completely on uh, on geophysics alone, and uh, you know, conceptual you know three D geology. So yeah, look, I'm inspired by that. I think uh, you know a lot of easy deposits have been found in in Western Australia now. So you know, companies have got to be uh, a little bit more ambitious about how uh, how they target their opportunities. Absolutely, Corey. Thanks for that. Let's move on to James Wilson, the CEO of Alchemy Resources. Now, James, uh, what would you say your number one priority is for the business right now? Oh, it most certainly has to be uh, pushing forward this new um, lithium uh, dual stream we have at Coroni. It's by far there's a uh, there's certainly an opportunity for both investors and for uh, the market. You know, as you've seen some of the statistics on lithium supply that the uh, Australia or the world can only supply about half of it going forward. So, you know, if we can find something, the best place to find a deposit is next to another deposit. We've got two of them. We've got lithium up the road and gold right next door to us. So, and it's even next door to our own gold deposit. So. Yeah, what better to have two deposits, uh, two wins on the same ground? Can't be, can't beat that. Well, they say lightning doesn't strike twice in the same spot. I beg to differ based on that explanation, that is for sure. Now, uh, Dave, we'll come across to you here, mate. Now, Elon Musk has said that ESG is, quote, a scam. 
Do you agree or disagree with that comment? Uh, I'd have to disagree with that. I think that um, it's, <laughs> it's really important to look after the environment, look after your other stakeholders. Um, you know, I, I previously worked at the Superboot in Kalgoorlie and it's one of those places where it becomes so obvious to you that you have to um, consider a lot of different people and a lot of different uh, attitudes towards mining. Yet if you don't take care of your environment, then you won't have support and you lose that social license. Absolutely well said. Now, uh, Lindsay, coming to you, mate, I know you're a very busy bloke and that's why we've got this question lined up for you. Obviously, James already mentioned that there's an involvement there as well with Alchemy and obviously you've uh, been with Jindalee now, obviously, since the beginning. You are, in, in fact, the co-founder of it. So uh, the question for you, Lindsay, is what does a typical day look like for you? I can imagine it's just jam-packed. Oh, look, I'm very lucky. I'm surrounded by people that are a lot smarter than me. And and so I, uh, I I tend to rely on them. They're young, they're energetic, as I said, and they're very smart. Um, and, I, and so it's more of, of trying to just, you know, make sure everything is heading in the right direction. I, I do um, field a lot of queries from, from shareholders and potential investors. Um, and, and uh, you know, obviously with a, with a, a our main focus being in the United States. There are a lot of um, uh, Zoom meetings at, at weird hours uh, to fit in with uh, maybe US investors or interested parties or, or even, you know, government officials or, 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 or key people over there. So, look, um, days, uh, it's not a nine to five job, shall we say, James. <laughs> I think Chuckles all around there pretty much identifies exactly what we're all thinking. <laughs> Never seems to stop. Uh, Corey, you've had a little chuckle there, so we'll come back to you. Why not? Uh, how do you think Scandium will transform your business into the future? Look, Scandium's a really interesting metal. Uh, it's got a, a huge potential application as a alloy with, uh, with aluminium. And fundamentally, to, to unlock that value, uh, we need to be able to... Um, produce you know, scanium cheaper than we can make it today. So we're doing a lot of work around how we can um, uh, produce it at lower cost and also um, capture more of that uh, that value chain. So I think that's really the key is just getting it um, at a lower cost and uh, making it much more competitive with the price of other alloys. And uh, and then I think we'll uh, we'll, we'll see that, uh, you know, value that um, uh, market opportunity for, for scanium unlock. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Uh, James, we'll come back to you here as well. Can you, um, I suppose the question for you would be, what are the other exciting things that are happening at Alchemy this year that you might not have already touched on so far? Uh, like I think by far sort of getting back into New South Wales after all the COVID lockouts been sort of the, the biggest hurdle for us, obviously uh, the island state that was Western Australia uh, for, for, for better or worse. And so being able to get over to New South Wales, I mean, Yellow Mountain, you know, we've got 7% copper on surface that's been sort of got from the mullet stumps of these things, just gaining access into there and just getting just getting on the ground and do some work. It's, it's you know, formidable ground. Uh, we're really still, you know, pushing on the West Australian stuff, but, but New South Wales has, has certainly got the potential to have some, some very high yielding, high value asset uh, and uh, value for Alchemy shareholders going forward. Well, I might post this question to all of you then, and uh, James will start with your response, but how frustrating has the last two years been trying to sort out the logistics of going over borders and just working within the government restrictions? Has it been challenging? Um, for us uh, at Alchemy, it's it's actually been quite, uh, I, I like to say, easy. Um, we actually put a team in place of, uh, of people prior to that all happening. So we were very lucky that we had a, a network of, of uh, technical colleagues who we could deploy. So. It was a phone call away in New South Wales. Obviously, when New South Wales had its own regional lockouts, it was difficult to travel intrastate. Uh, but no, we, we were okay. Uh, we weathered that actually quite fine. So even internally with personnel issues, uh, availability of people, all that sort of stuff, we were, we were quite lucky. We built that team prior to that actually happening. So yeah, we could at least get some, some uh, things done, which is, uh, yeah, my condolences to everybody else. So. <laughs> Well, we'll see exactly what their experience was. Lindsay, well, what about yourself? How, how did that happen for Jindalee? Yeah, um, look, being based, well, having the, the, the main asset in, in the United States and not being able to travel over there was incredibly frustrating. Uh, we were reliant on uh, consultants uh, to basically do the work for us. Um, and we were lucky that we wound up getting 
some pretty good consultants to help us. And and so as a result of that, you know, if you'd said to me at the start of COVID, will will you and and bearing in mind the travel restrictions, would will you be able to drill and continue to advance the project? Uh, you know, through the, the height of COVID, I said, look, I very much doubt it. Uh, but we were, you know, we we uh, we continued to drill. Um, uh, you know, we drilled last year, we drilled the year before, um, and, and so the project moved forward. Um, it was frustrating because uh, a lot of the, the, you know, the permitting process in the United States is a lot slower than it is, say, in Western Australia. Uh, and, and so there's a lot more, you know, boxes to tick. And, and a lot of the government uh, officials who we're liaising with to, to, you know, get the drilling permits in place, etc. I mean, they were off work because of COVID. They were very hard to very hard to contact, and 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 so you know things things took longer, and it was a bit frustrating for for, uh, for shareholders. But we got there eventually, and and you know, as I said, we'll be putting out a uh, an updated resource uh, next month now, early next month, based on the the drilling that we completed in December. We think that'll be a positive development, and shareholders should you know be be pleased with that. Uh, and and then there'll be a big drilling program coming up in September. But you know, being able to get out on the ground over there at the start of this month was fantastic. To meet the consultants who had been helping us over the last two years, none of whom we'd met face to face before. Wow. Um, uh, it was it was great just to be able to go over there and thank them all and 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 you know and basically make sure the project's you know heading in the right direction. So. Yeah, it's certainly been a strange couple of years. Dave, what about yourself at C29? Did you have many difficulties you had to contend with? Yes, uh, we did have some drilling happening in New South Wales at a time when we weren't able to travel there. Uh, similar to what the, the previous uh, speakers have mentioned, we had to rely on contractors. Um, we weren't able to go to the sites and ground truth things for ourselves, which is quite frustrating, um, but it certainly helped us to become more adaptable. Uh, mm. We've had to learn new things on the fly uh, and we've really had to put our trust in people. And I think it shows the, the quality of, um, uh, of geologists operating in Australia that those people have really come through for us. They did excellent work and they've helped us to move forward. Absolutely. And Corey, just to round up that question, for Platina Resources, what was the situation like over the last two years? Yeah, look, it was quite difficult. I'm Brisbane based and uh, I'd sort of historically relied quite heavily on using consultants to uh, to get our business activities done. And, uh, you know, sometimes when it comes to dealing with Indigenous issues, um, you know, consultants aren't always the, the, the best way to go. It's better to, you know, the company like myself uh, be on the ground uh, and, you know, talking to, to the traditional owners and, and dealing with those types of issues. That was probably an area where we, we suffered the most. I think you can always get a good access to consultants for doing geological uh, type activities. But yeah, look, we, you know, we've probably suffered a few de delays because of that. And then uh, we made the decision to to hire an exploration manager, but in the middle of the, the boom, it was very difficult to get access to people. And uh, But eventually we've got Rowan and uh, you know, we're sort of strongly moving forward now. Absolutely. And, and that is exactly the, the thing that we want to see for 2022. It's all systems go for all four of you, which is good to see. It's been a bit of a challenging time. Uh, Dave, I'll throw it back to you here. What, what would you say is one thing that people don't know about investing in a mining business? That's a big question. Um, I don't know. That's, uh, that's a hard one to answer. There's probably more than one thing. Uh, there'd be... Um, no, you've thrown me a little bit there. I've got to be honest. <laughs> um, we like to do. We like to grill you in these kind of things. But... <laughs> Uh, I guess they just they don't know how much work goes on behind the scenes. I suppose if you look at if you only know a company through their ASX announcements and you don't see anything come out for a, a period of time, you might think that you know there's a there's it's quiescent that we're in the office not doing much. But the reality is, you know, we're in here 10, 12 hours a day, and we're we're always plugging away and um, trying to move things forward and trying to add value. Um, I think that's probably the key. Yeah, look, it's absolutely not as simple as going and grabbing a rig and then putting a hole in the ground. There's so many different steps to, uh, to even get to that process and then thereafter. It's, it can be very challenging indeed. Let's go out. One final question for each of you now. Lindsay, we'll come to you. Uh, as you look forward to becoming a pure play lithium company, do you think lithium could well become the next gold? Obviously, it's highly sought after with uh, EVs moving forward, for example. 
Yeah, look, it is interesting. I mean, I, 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 I tried it. I mean, obviously, from a global perspective, we've seen the, the world moving strongly towards electrification in that the, the previous uh, uh, century was all about the internal combustion engine and the century before that was about the steam engine. This uh, does appear to be the, the electric um, century. Uh, and, and, you know, governments, you know, particularly Western governments are heavily man mandating for the um, the introduction of EVs uh, and and uh, phasing out of, of uh, in, internal combustion engine uh, cars, for example. Um, from a US point of view, there's one uh, statistic that I think is really interesting. Um, the uh, benchmark uh, minerals intelligence, who are uh, probably the, the one of the leaders in, in analysing um, uh, the, the, the lithium space, uh, supply, demand, etc. Uh, they've, they've pointed out that, you know, currently the US produces about, internally, about uh, 5,000 tonnes of lithium carbonate. And by 2030, they're going to need 340,000 tonnes of lithium carbonate if they are to meet their um, projected, uh, you know, sort of uh, supply of EVs and, and, and uh, storage batteries, etc. Uh, where's the lithium coming from? You know, like, like they're just, and, and, and you know, you can basically running parallel with that, you've got Europe and, and you've got, um, you know, China in particular, uh, moving strongly in, into EVs. Um, look, it's hard to see uh, the lithium price, uh, you know, the supply being able to keep up with the demand. Uh, in, in the medium term, short to medium term anyway. Uh, and that's got to be positive for the, the lithium price. It, it, like it's obviously, you know, it's currently, I think fast markets today is about 73,000 tonnes, uh, dollars a tonne for lithium carbonate. Like, look, it could, it could fall back to 60, but it's hard to see it falling back to sub tens, which is where it was, you know, 12, 18 months ago. So. Lindsay, thank you so much. Let's now come to, uh, to Corey for your final question. Corey, what would success mean for Platina Resources, do you think? Yeah, look, my my pure focus is uh, is to build a, a major mineable resource in uh, in one of our projects. So, you know, hopefully we can get that ball rolling with back-to-back uh, uh, -back drill programs uh, starting in the next few months. Yeah, tremendous. Short and sweet. Love it. That's good stuff. Corey, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's also throw it here to James. Now, final question for you, and it's a little bit similar to one we've already touched on, but I do like to get inside the heads of our CEOs here. And I suppose the question is, what motivates you to get out of the bed in the morning? Uh, it's uh, it's actually an interesting question, and I've I've actually got an answer for that. It's, um, I spoke to one of my colleagues. Uh, I won't name him, but he does actually work for Degray and may have been responsible for the discovery there. So, uh, Andy Beckwith, um, and uh, said, so how's it? What's it like, mate? You know, when you you guys you guys. You wake up in the morning, mate, and you just don't know if today is going to be the day. And for us, a couple of weeks ago, that was that was one of those days. You know, you sort of come out with a lithium uh, anomalism over 10k just down the road from a, a lithium deposit, and you go, mate, this is this is the one in a thousand. This is it. And uh, yeah. that that you jump out a bit and you you skip down the road. It's uh, it's exciting. Uh, you've generated the wealth and the value for shareholders just based on any of your boots on the ground and you see it and you see something that no one else has ever seen before and it's amazing the feeling is is just it's an adrenaline it's a it's a really good positive adrenaline vibe so uh yeah that's it <laughs> i don't know it's kind of like the mirage that comes to fruition so yeah really exciting stuff and uh let's now wrap up with dave this is another tough one for you i'm sorry mate we've got a few to throw at you today but uh, i i know you're an expert in your field itself but let's get out of your comfort zone a little bit have you ever tried to do something and you knew you probably weren't going to be uh, setting the world on fire with it, but you did it anyway? And, and how did you overcome the challenge of completing that particular exercise or activity, whatever it might have been? Yes, yes, I suppose I have. Um, I've spent most of my career in, in exploration uh, and there was a period maybe 10 years ago now where uh, just exploration dried up, the market had gone. Uh, there was essentially, I, I couldn't, find myself a job in exploration that I wanted to do um, mm -hmm. and I took the leap into underground production geology which was although it's still geology it's completely different um, it was a huge challenge and uh, I just had to jump in I had to rely on people who who knew more than I did and I just had to ask questions and, and learn as quickly as I could um, and I think that it's 
it actually really helped me going forwards because it gives you a different perspective on things. Once you've been underground and through inside a gold mine, then you know exactly what you're looking for when you're drilling for one from surface. So otherwise, it, it's um, it's much harder to connect those dots. Mm. No, I think it is very much a case of uh, sink or swim. And if you don't have a little floaty device there from time to time, whether it be leaning on other people for uh, for more knowledge or even tapping into the resources of people that have been there and been successful in the past, then you know it is very much a case of you'll probably go all the way to the bottom. But Dave, Corey, James and Lindsay, you're all certainly floating at the moment. Thank you so much for your time today. Just before I do let you all go, I'll just get a final thought that you'd like to leave with our audience here today. Dave, given we've just been having a chat, first is on you, mate. Uh, I just think keep keep watching C29. We've got a lot coming up in the next six months. We're going to hit all these projects hard. And I think that, you know, there's definitely success to be had. There's discoveries to be made. I think we're the only way is up for us. Brilliant. Uh, Corey, how about yourself and Platina? Yeah, look, uh, <clears throat> similar sentiment. It's all about generating news flow and uh, we'll be doing back-to-back -back drill programs, uh, hopefully looking to unlock the value of our Scanium project, uh, securing new project opportunities. So um, if we can get a discovery out of uh, the back of one of those uh, drilling programs, um, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of potential upside from our low market cap. Wonderful, Corey, thank you so much. Uh, James, same question to yourself. Uh, final thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience? Uh, yeah, on my first day of work as a geo, uh, someone actually told me, a very famous guy, uh, Ed Escher, said, uh, yeah, James, the, the more you drill, the more you find. So uh, we're not going to die not knowing. So uh, Alchemy is certainly about that. We're stepping it up with uh, aggressive on all fronts, lithium, gold, and uh, where we can drill, we'll be in there doing it and uh, trying to generate value for shareholders as, uh, as quickly as possible. Mate, very similar sentiment to what my old soccer coach said. If you don't shoot, you can't score. And that is exactly what you're doing there. So good stuff. Uh, thank you so much, James. And Lindsay, just wrapping up with yourself. Thoughts that you'd yeah. like to leave the audience? Yeah, look, well, hopefully uh, your investors have seen from our presentation that, you know, we we uh, we offer a lot of upside for, for shareholders. And there's a lot of uh, catalysts coming up in the next uh six to eight months that we think will will help uh, bridge the gap on our peers and and um you know, obviously we're sitting in an environment uh in the united states in particular which is where there are very strong tailwinds for critical minerals including lithium so we're kind of in the in the right place at the right time with the right project and gee the rest of it you know we, we've we've uh, We've just got to make the most of it. Absolutely. Well, look, all four of you have certainly made the most of joining us here today and uh, presenting some wonderful presentations and also answering the questions. So I thank you all very much for being involved with this edition of the Invest Nest webinar. Gents, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks, James. Much appreciated. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And uh, thanks, everyone, for attending as well today. That does wrap up this edition of our Invest Nest webinar series. If you do want to have a little look back on it, we'll be putting up a couple of highlights on the YouTube channel, so make sure to check it out at Calkine Media. That is where you can get all the information. And if you want any further info as well, calkine.com.au. And I'm sure if there are any questions that potentially we haven't answered, you can also send us an email, info at calkinemedia.com. We can even pass it on to our experts. Thank you so much. That brings to a conclusion this edition of our webinar. You have a wonderful day. And gents, thank you one final time.